Greetings from the beyond. Join us at Paranormal M as we uncover the secrets of the paranormal. Hit subscribe and turn on notifications to stay tuned for our latest explorations into the unexplained. Ask Reddit. I was 11 years old and I was with my 7 year old cousin eating Oreos in his bunk bed. I went to the hallway to throw out the trash because that's where the trash can was. He had a long hallway with a staircase at the end of it. As I threw the trash away and looked down the hallway, I saw a man coming toward me. My first reaction was that it was his dad who had woke up and was about to yell at us for, you know, being up eating Oreos. So I ran back into my cousin's room and got in bed and told him to act like he was sleeping. I remember being freezing cold the whole time and shaking. After a couple of seconds went by, I realized what I saw looked nothing like my uncle. What I had seen was an apparition of a man. He had no legs and he was floating toward me at rapid speed. His eyes were hollow and his whole body seemed gray. His hair was flowing and wasn't very long, but the most distinctive feature was that he had a top hat on. I ended up telling my cousin what had happened and it freaked him out too. Barely slept at all at night, but the absolute crazy part was the next morning. I went downstairs and had breakfast with my uncle and my cousin. My cousin then said to his dad that I'd seen a ghost last night. I was embarrassed because I knew it sounded silly and I didn't want my uncle to think I was crazy. My uncle's eyes suddenly widened and he stared at me. After a couple of seconds went by, he slowly asked, Was he wearing a top hat? Turns out my uncle had seen this ghost before too. Totally validated my experience. There's no way he would have known this detail beforehand considering I never mentioned it. Ask Reddit. We lived in an old farm that then turned into an old folks home with one half being a nursing station and then a priest from a church loved in it or lived and there was multiple different family that live in the house. The house was combined with the apartment in quotes, which was a unit smaller than a bungalow. which was the nursing station. We lived in the house part, and the apartment was separated with the wall and a room that had two doors. One half-sized door and one full-sized door. In the apartment, there was always a spooky feeling going over there once you went over. You always felt like something is watching you. An uneasing feeling. And as soon as you went to leave or exit, it would feel like something wants you back there. One day, my father decided to open the apartment up with the rest of the house. Open up the wall separating the apartment and the house. While he was cutting the wall down, there was a very old white door boarded in between that wall. For some reason, my father replaced that door with one of those shaded glass doors. It had like a turn knob handle and very still and specific way to open a door. We had three dogs growing up. One day we were out visiting my grandparents, so the dogs got left home. When we arrived back at home, one of our three dogs went missing, looking everywhere for her and couldn't find her, until I opened the apartment door, which there she was, sitting on the other side of the door, silent as can be, staring back at it. Over all the years, this dog would always greet you when you got home, and this dog would always scratch or bark at a door if she got locked into it, but she didn't. He passed away a month ago, and he now visits me all the time. A little background. Right before we broke up, I gave him an ultimatum, which was either make a real effort to change by leaving his triggers behind and work toward battering himself emotionally, mentally, physically, and professionally, which I support, or respect that this is not the life I want and it's time that we end things. He gave me the most honest answer any addict could give, which was, 
I want to change, but I can't promise you I can, and I understand where you're coming from, and I'll respect your wishes. As hard as it was to end things, we did. And at this time, I was living a hundred miles away from him because I was in college. And though we had a lot of his property in my apartment, he stayed with his parents because he had a bar job near their home, which really was where he would get drugs. He drove down to have this conversation, but it was right after midnight when he arrived. I asked him to take his cat home, gave him my ring, said I would pack his stuff and arrange for him to come and pick it up. He agreed. We cuddled for about 30 minutes, talked a bit. He then grabbed his cat and left. One of the last things I told him before he left was to never let me get the call that he died. He laughed, told me that that would never happen. After that, I never saw him again. His mom called me a few days later and said that he went into an inpatient care. She then stated that she and his father would be coming down to grab his stuff when I was ready for them to do so. His family and I got along wonderfully, and we still do, so I was happy to have them come down, and we arranged for it to happen a couple of weeks later. When they came down, I helped them move his items out. As I was loading their truck, his mom and I were talking, and she thanked me for everything, as well as reiterated that she didn't blame me one bit for leaving. She prayed that he would get clean and live a full life, to which I agreed. I told her, I don't ever want to get back with him but I want to see him live a happy, full life and hope that we could at best be friends again. Time passed and we both moved on. I met an incredible man at school who I'm still with today. He met another sweet woman whom he had a kid with. Sadly, they didn't work out, and however he dated multiple sweet ladies, including the sweet lady he was with when he passed. I would periodically get texts from him over the years and Though I would reply, I was definitely not the talker between the two of us. I never wanted to give him false hope that we would get back together. In addition, I would hear through the grapevine periodically that he was still using, which his pictures on social media supported because I could see it on his face and in his eyes. This is where things got weird. On Friday, December 16th, I got the call I always feared friend from Hawaii, where we lived for four to six years we were together, called me. Called me to tell me he overdosed and he was in a coma. What was crazy was that I turned off my Facebook Messenger notices a few weeks earlier because I was getting so many notifications, yet before this call came in, his brother and sister-in-law tried to message me on there. I, of course, lost it. Our friend said he was flying out to stay with his family to go see him in the hospital. So I told him we'll talk more when he gets here. The next day, our Hawaii friend texted me to tell me, well, he was coming in on Monday. Said his mom said there was no sign of brain activity, but they had more tests to run yet. It was this night when things started to get weird. I woke up at around 2.30 a.m. from a dead sleep and I felt him leave. It was a feeling I never felt before, and I knew right there and then that he was gone. I knew he was not coming back. The next day I called a few other people who we knew in Hawaii that we didn't know. Well, rather that they didn't know what had happened. You know, to tell them that he was in a coma and we were sure that he wasn't going to make it. As I was talking to one of our other mutual friends, I suddenly felt I was about to get that call that he was officially dead. Within two to three minutes, I had another call come in. It was my ex-brother-in-law. I answered and said, Is this that call? He mumbled through his tears. Yeah, I'm so sorry, sweetheart. I said, Okay, thank you. I love you. He told me he loved me too, and we hung up. That night I woke up at 3.30 a.m. from a dead sleep and I heard his laugh clear as day in the living room. He had a very unique laugh that I could recognize anywhere. I couldn't go back to sleep. I was in tears. I knew he was there. Later that day, my boyfriend and I started to pack for a trip we were getting ready to go on. It was the following week for Christmas. My boyfriend had a Spotify on and eventually it started to play random songs that were similar to his playlist. Three of my favorite songs that my ex would play, 
and he was a musician. They came on in a row. Tripped me out so much that I went and restarted the playlist midway through the third song. The next day I went to the store to grab a couple of last minute gifts and toiletries for a trip. As I was in the store, the same three songs that were played the day before, in the same order mind you, started to play. When the third song came on, I dropped my items and left. That night I woke up from a dead sleep at 3.30 a.m., but this time it was because I felt someone sitting on the end of the bed. I knew he was there, and I didn't go back to sleep. The next day, my boyfriend and I flew out of our holiday trip. We landed in Vegas because it was the closest airport to our destination. I'd never been to Vegas, so we toured the... Toward the whole strip before departing to our exact destination. I was having so much fun and getting lost in life. Then guess what starts playing in one of the casinos? The same three songs in the same order. I was completely freaked out. I couldn't believe it. Things settled for about a week, with the exception of waking up every night at 3.30 a.m. precisely. This time, though, I wouldn't hear, sense, or see anything. I would just wake up. The day we were getting ready to head home, my boyfriend's brother was driving us to the airport. Guess what comes on the radio? The same three songs in the same frickin' order. By this point, I already accepted that it was him. His funeral was the day after we got home, which I went to. His family was happy to see me, our friend from Hawaii was happy I was there, and many of our mutual friends were there. They were very happy to see me too. All in all, I was glad I went, but it was hard. But a couple of nights where I slept through the night, and then he started to appear in my dreams. The first couple I shrugged off as my grief. The third time he appeared in my dream, I couldn't dismiss it as grief. He kept telling me that I need to try hard cider with whiskey, as we sat in a recording studio with two of our other friends who passed years prior. I kept trying to tell a group outside of the room something through a loudspeaker, but kept getting interrupted by my ex and our other deceased friends. When I woke up, I couldn't stop thinking about the drink. I reached out to my friend from Hawaii, who was staying on my ex's family's farm later in the day. I asked him without any context, Do you all have a thing with hard cider with whiskey? He laughed and was like, Yeah, why? This wasn't a thing I knew about, and it was definitely not a thing when my ex and I were together, so I was mind-fucked, but I was like, okay. After this, I started to wake up every night at 3.30 a.m. until last night. Last night, I had the craziest dream of them all. My ex and I were in this random hotel room in Vegas talking. He then started to ask about my current boyfriend but not in a way that was uncomfortable, more like he wanted to know more. I told him how happy he and I were, and that I think that we're the best thing that ever happened to each other. He smiled and told me he was happy for me, and that all he wanted was for me to be happy. I asked him if well, I would lay down and cuddle with him, though. I said I would, but nothing sexual, because it's not fair to my boyfriend. He said okay, and we did. He whispered my ear and told me that he'll always love me, always be happy, never give up, and change the world, and then I woke up. Today has been rather crazy. I've been presented with three incredible opportunities out of the blue, one academic and two professional, all of which I'm considering and taking the next steps to apply for all of which would allow me to build my life-saving research project. In addition, I got a random message on LinkedIn from someone asking me if my current employer is hiring, which I verified they are. I didn't want to leave my current employer stranded when I moved on to bigger and better things. I can't say if it was him or if it was all in my head, but somehow I feel a sense of peace. I know that he always cared for me and I always cared for him, but we were on two different paths in this world. I don't feel scared and I no longer feel alone. I have my best friend back, and I have part of my old group back. They're just spirits, which I'm totally okay with, and in some ways almost happier about it because they're always there. I know some may dismiss this, but maybe my story will bring a sense of peace to others. Death is not the end.
It is just another form of life. I don't truly understand it, but I do not fear it. All I know is that having my spirit homies is badass. And though it sucks that they died, I'm glad that they're around me. I saw the same woman my girlfriend saw during her night terror. My girlfriend from now six months have recurring weird sleep episodes. Sleepwalking, talking in her sleep, and night terrors where she tells me that she saw things. When these kind of episodes happen, I reassured her every time, saying there's nothing that I'm here for her. It would calm her down every time. Starting to be used to these episodes. Two weeks ago, she told me that she saw a scary woman near her face when she woke up. She was saying it was a night terror episode and we both believed it. But last night, I slept at her place. I woke up in the middle of the night and saw a woman's silhouette standing near my girlfriend. At first, I was sure it was my girlfriend, but fast enough, I realized she was still in bed next to me. I then looked at the silhouette. It was a woman, her back to me, but her head was turned toward me and she had a creepy smile. She had long black kinky hair and at first I was sure that it was just a hallucination since I was just sleeping a minute ago. Perhaps this vision was going to fade away. But no, she didn't move an inch. I was still seeing her. She was stuck in a loop back to me turning toward me with a creepy smile. I analyzed the situation, still thinking it was a hallucination, and I just close my eyes and fall back asleep. In the morning, I talked to my girlfriend about that. When I described the woman, she told me to stop laughing at her. I told her I lied just to reassure her, but I'm pretty sure we saw the same thing. She's going to move at the end of the month, but in the meantime, what should I do? I don't feel she's in danger, but oh man, that's scary. I saw a shadow person right before my eyes. So lately around her house, we've seen a spike of paranormal activity. That's the closer my mom is getting to her death date. She has cancer and she's expected to pass away sometime next month. Lately, paranormal activity in our house has been spiking a lot. Before, it was just the dog looking at random corners and staring down the hall off into the distance, which is something she's never done before. We've also heard random thudding from time to time, but it's extremely rare when it happens, and it's usually across the house, and she's usually bedridden, so I don't know what if it's, well, rather, so I know it's not her causing the noise. She says the dog is usually next to her, too. Lately, about three months ago, I started seeing a black orb in the corner of my eye from time to time in the ceiling. Thought maybe I was just tired. But I saw the dog look at it too. That happened several times over the last couple months. I brought it up to my mom and she said that she saw the orb from time to time too. It would be late at night, but I always saw it during the day usually in the family room. A couple of times we've seen a white orb pop up randomly recently, within the last couple of weeks. And one time, my mom said she's watched the black orb pop into view and shortly after the white orb chased it off. I've only seen the white orb once or twice. I'm not an expert in the paranormal, but normally the only thing I've heard about orbs being mentioned is in photographs, never with the naked eye. I've never seen a ghost, so I don't know if I believe in them, at least anymore. But the orb thing is just hard to ignore. Usually I would just play it off as seeing like a spot in my eye, but the fact that my dog reacted to it, my mom confirming it, freaks me out. I should also point out our house is not haunted, and this activity started recently after her death date's getting closer. Now that I've explained all of that, I'd like to explain my shadow person's sighting. I should point out that this was in broad daylight, not in the corner of my eye. Most people, when they see a shadow person, it's always in the corner of their eye. 
this thing was dead in front of my line of sight. The best way I can describe it is there's a chair in my dining room that was pulled out from where my mom was sitting about an hour ago. She didn't put it back. I went to go grab something off the kitchen table and for half a split second the air got really heavy and thick. The outline of a man appeared with a bald head and hair on the side. I looked down and I saw his arms in his lap. I want to be very clear. I did not see a person or ghost. It was the outline of a shadow. I brought this up to my mom and she went pale, pulled out a picture of my grandpa and asked me if it was him. I've never seen grandpa before because he passed away a long time ago. But the second I saw his bald head and the hair on the side like I saw in the shadow, I sat in disbelief. Now I'm an extremely skeptical person, and a believer in the paranormal. But despite not having my own paranormal experiences before this, just really was hard to write off. I suck at telling stories. That's the title. I'm excited for this one for some reason. I had little experiences before meeting my husband, but since being with him, I've had too many to count. For my first time sharing, I figured I'd tell the most intense one so far. It's kind of long, so bear with me. We had moved to a new house, and the first night there is what started everything. My husband is a walking magnet for the paranormal and had a crazy dream about the house. In this dream, he said we were in a bed watching TV. When he looked down the hallway, he saw a lady standing at the end of it. At that same moment, she started screaming and running at us at full speed. A face print burned into the wall, and as soon as she reached him, he woke up physically screaming. After that night, things started getting weird. We hear people whispering, see shadows out of the corner of our eyes. We even get the ickiest feeling walking anywhere in the house. It got to the point that we all camped in the living room and before it got dark, I'd grab everything I'd need for the night and everyone refused to go into the room until morning because of whatever reason, nothing would happen in that room. We'd sit and watch shadows peek around the corners throughout the night and hear the whispers until we fell asleep. A few weeks into living there, my husband was taking the dog out, left the door open, and when he turned around to come back in, he saw what he can only describe as the top hat man standing in the doorway and turning to walk through the house. It scared him so bad that he ran inside and smoked the whole house out with the entire bundle of sage that I had. Things only escalated from there. I had to get this feeling of doom that sat so heavy on my chest that I had to go sit outside to get it to go away. We eventually found out that an older man had passed away in the apartment below ours at some point. A few months into living there, the new tenant downstairs ended up having an electrical fire, which ultimately made everyone have to vacate. It's been a couple of years since we've lived there and we still talk about it from time to time. My Husband's Story This was about two years before we moved to the house that was featured in my previous post. As I mentioned in that previous post, my husband is a magnet for the paranormal. He's seen things for as long as he can remember, still freaked out when things happen. Anyways, he had went to an abandoned hospital with a friend. When they went, it was broad daylight. Once they were inside the building, my husband kept track of any turns that made, or that they made, so they could make sure that they went back the same way. As they were going through, we noticed bullet holes in the walls and blood stains that looked like people had been drugged down the hallways. They saw things running around the peripheral vision and had chairs rolling across the floors right in front of them. They even heard things running around. He 
said it could have been animals, but they never saw a single animal, so who knows? After that, he said things started to feel weird, and then he noticed that it had gotten darker outside. But it didn't make sense to him, because it felt like they were only there for maybe an hour. So they were ready to leave at this point. He started following his notes to backtrack to get out, and once they reached what should have been the stairwell to get them out, it ended up being nothing but a solid wall. He said he knew that they were in the right spot because the graffiti on the wall around it was the exact same as when he saw it when they first got in. It caused them to panic. They started trying to get out of any door they could find. They came across a door that had a sign on it that says, do not enter, dead inside. It ended up being the morgue, and they had to go through it to find the way out. The only door he could force his way through was a door leading to the roof. Once they got outside, they had to go across the roof and down into a stairwell of another part of the hospital just to get out. He said it almost felt as if whatever was in there didn't want them to leave. This last part sounds a little crazy, but he swears by it. He said when they got back to the car, he noticed he had dropped something, went back to go look around the window for it. When he got back to the window, there was a little girl standing just inside and threw what he was looking for on the ground in front of him as she was telling him not to come back in. He grabbed it and ran so fast he ended up tripping and actually tore something in his knee and still has problems from it to this day. Choose to believe it or not. He goes white as a ghost and starts sweating every time he tells the story. I had asked him to take me to check it out and he refused to ever step foot back in there again. He had tried tearing it down for years, or they did, whoever they are, but every crew that went in would leave and refuse to go back. It wasn't until around two years ago that they successfully tore it down. Now it sits in piles with a parking garage still standing. The Girl in the Blue Dress This is my favorite paranormal experience to retell. It happened to me when I was very young, around 9, maybe 10 years old. I used to live in these old townhomes. I wanted to do some research on them because all the family paranormal stories happened there. The layout of our house was pretty small. We had the living room as soon as you entered the door, and then a nice little kind of bar area which overlooked the kitchen. It was facing the kitchen, and on the left were the stairs. Anyways, I was sitting in the living room while my grandmother and mom were talking in the kitchen. And to be honest, I don't remember what I was doing, but I was sitting on the couch that faced the kitchen. Our bar area had bar stools that could obviously be sat on, and as children, we'd like to spin as fast as we could on them. We loosened them up to a certain point where they could no longer face straight. They would be facing the stairs. I turned to face the stools, and there was a little girl sitting on one of them. She was looking down with her long hair in front of her face. I remember her vividly. She was wearing a long blue dress that was a tad bit dirty. There was no negative energy coming off of her from what I remember. But seeing that as a child, I still am scared by it. After a couple of seconds of me looking at her, she turned her head up almost to look at me, and at the same time my grandmother asked me if I can get something from her room. So I ran up the stairs, and upon return, she was gone. Unusual Activity I'm a 15-year-old male. Last summer, I had a weird excuse with the supernatural. Interesting word choice. It all started when we were doing an all-nighter outside when we eventually got to cold. Decided to go back to our friend's house. We were all having a good time until I got a very weird feeling that something was off and there was something with us. Especially the door in his room was putting me off. Eventually, we had enough and three-quarters of us decided to go to our other friend's house. As we were packing up, we began to hear crying from our friend's little brothers. Presumably from the room, 
despite them being fast asleep. As we were leaving, we noticed a door that, according to our friend, doesn't exist. We go into the kitchen to leave out the back, and one of our friends claims to have seen something dark and tall running across the garden. He's usually quite calm, but he was freaked out and grabbed a knife and tried running up the stairs to check on our friend whose house we were in. Eventually, our friend's dad comes to pick us up, and as we're getting in, I feel the intuition to put my seatbelt on, which I never do. The dad begins to speed down the road, almost crashing into curbs down the road as it turned out he was drunk. The following morning, we go to check our friend who was at the house it all happened in. He says that he heard his mom crying from the room that doesn't exist despite the fact that she was in the other room asleep. Me and my friend whose dad drove us home would spend the night at his house to take our mind off things when I randomly have insomnia really badly. I never have had any sleep problems, so. Out of desperation and answers, we pray to God hoping for his protection. And despite a few small events afterwards, nothing. My best friend since 1983 came to visit me. Three years ago, my best friend Gary passed away from diabetes. He had been very sick, having complications from the disease. He had his toes amputated first, and then his foot, and then the leg below the knee, and two days after, his leg above the knee. He was a trooper, though. A month after the final surgery, he went back to his employer. He was a truck driver. Asked when he could come back to work. His employer said that he couldn't drive the truck, and Gary told him that if he could pull himself into the truck, then he could drive it. His boss said, prove it. Gary rolled his wheelchair over to the driver's side of the truck, pulled himself into the steps and opened the door. Then he grabbed the rail and reached for the steering wheel and pulled himself into the cab of the truck, and he started, well, started it up and drove away. His boss was amazed. Sorry about that, I drifted. Not me, that's what they wrote. Gary's in the hospital the last month of his life. He told his girlfriend he didn't want to die in the hospital. Somehow he convinced the doctors that he was fine and they released. Two hours later, he and his girlfriend were talking and his eyes rolled back in his head and he quietly left this world behind. Two weeks later, I had a dream that myself, Gary, and all of our friends were camping at our local lake. Now, Gary had a great sense of humor, and this whole dream was like in his sense of humor. It was one of the funniest dreams I've ever had, but the thing I noticed and still stands out in my mind was that he wasn't sick, and he had both legs, he was younger, and the last thing he said before I woke up was, I'm whole again, and I'm getting pretty much all better. It was a great dream. I can't really go into details of the dream, but I can tell you it was hilarious. He's okay now, and he's not suffering anymore. I was at every member of his family's funerals, and they're almost all gone except for his sister. I love that family, and I'm glad Gary and his family called him Gopher, and that's what I always called him too. I'm glad he came back to make me laugh one more time to tell me he was okay. Rest in peace, Gopher. Carlton, friend, colleague, a man who is my friend. Many years ago I belonged to a volunteer fire company in Oxford, Connecticut. One of the elder statesmen in the firehouse, Carlton, grew up in the same town I did about 30 miles away. We became quite close because of this. A few years into my membership, Carl had gotten sick and passed away. I was one of the ones the FD chose to be a pallbearer. Carl always wore tan trousers and a different colored polo shirt every day. He was buried in tan trousers and a navy blue polo with our FD logo on it. Late one night, I was the last one in the firehouse just finishing up some paperwork and manpower reports for the chief's office. The rule was last one to leave has to make sure the house was secure. It was around 10.30 or 11 o'clock when I started my rounds to make sure all was locked up. 
When I came out of the meeting room on the apparatus floor, Carl came out of the men's room in his tan trousers and polo shirt about 15 feet away from me. I saw him with my very own eyes. It was so real I even called his name. He didn't look at me or even acknowledge me, just walked behind the engine toward the back of the house. By the time I got back behind the engine, I saw him turn the corner toward the back bays. I called out Carl again, but by the time I got back, he was gone. I know I saw him. He loved the Oxford Fire Department so much. My guess is, is that he couldn't leave. Haunted house living with four others. Knee tapping in figures and a moved painting. I've had quite a few strange occurrences, but this one house I lived in was a lot. I lived with three friends, all in our early 30s. The house would have been built in the maybe 1900s or maybe even earlier. My room. I would sleep terribly. I'm a great sleeper. And as soon as my lights were off, I would feel a suffocating feeling of darkness. It's hard to explain, but the air would feel thick. One night I fell asleep on my back with my knees up as I had a sore back. I woke up to the feeling of someone rhythmically tapping hard and thudding on my kneecaps. I was frozen in fear as it was dark and it was like a forced feeling. Bolted out of the room and ran to my friend's room. When I would shower I would hear a roommate arrive home, stomping in the wooden hallway. Typical loud roommate movements. And then, you know, you'd open the door and start chatting after a shower and the house would be empty. I would text everyone and not a single person had been at home. At this time, I was worried also about an intruder, of course, but had a feeling of dread every time. We had a new male roommate. They moved in. A really sweet guy. He was decorating his room when moving in and hung a cross decoration on an existing hook. It was kind of goth. A while later it caught his eye and it was swinging side to side against the wall. He had just moved in so didn't want to seem weird and tell us this, but this guy was spooked. We found out when things got worse and we all discussed it. Another roommate had a wall in her room with a, like a walk-in wardrobe area behind it. One night she woke up to what she thinks was a person peeking around staring at her like the exact silhouette and screamed for us to help and there was nothing there. Well, no, real person anyway. Last thing. We had lights which kept blowing. We asked our electrician friend to come check out the attic space as it was an old house and could have been anything, but he went up there while we were all at work. Apparently he had his torch up there as it was kind of dark and he shone it on a big framed painting. Got a fright. Went to look closer and it disappeared. Like searched the whole perimeter of the space and this giant painting was gone. He got such a bad feeling over him that he almost fell out of the manhole trying to scramble out. Anyway, that's all. We all still talk about it at times, but obviously moved out as soon as possible. Sometimes I drive by that house and still get a shiver. Such bad energy. Please help. Do we have some kind of attachment? It's getting to a point where we're starting to get concerned. Not necessarily for our safety, but because it's escalating. I'll begin with what led me to making this post. Last night my boyfriend heard something clearly whisper his name into his ear, followed by something touching his foot. He said it was almost like something was digging their thumb into the bottom of it. Here's why this is so concerning to us. In mid-2021, we had driven to a dead-end road that was built away from the main part of town to look at the stars. We were standing outside the car and he told me to get back in the car and then immediately drove off. He waited a few minutes until we were far enough away and said that he saw a black figure starting to move towards us in the tall grass a few hundred yards from us. The entire drive back to town, we could feel it in the back seat. I can't describe it in any other way than we both knew something was back there. 
remember my boyfriend was very emotional after, saying that he felt like he was going to uncontrollably sob and that he was overcome with grief and dread. Since that night, we've moved into three different apartments, all of them being in new build complexes. The first two we always joked about being haunted, we'd hear weird noises regularly in shadowy areas and the closets felt really off. Sometimes things would move, a light would be on that we couldn't remember turning on or the tap would start dripping. I literally said to my boyfriend, I hope that ghost doesn't follow us to the next place. When we moved from the second place, it did. We moved into our current apartment this past summer and the weird noises continued. Then we started to feel it again. We could feel it peering around the corner into our living room all the time. It also continued to make the closet just feel weird. Then a week or two ago he asked me if I had just laughed out of the blue. I hadn't, but I also hadn't heard anything. Then I heard something whisper, hey, and he didn't hear it. Then last night happened. So it's starting to get more comfortable or something, and we just don't want that. We both believe in ghosts and spirits, so honestly, it just makes noises and really wasn't a big deal. What we don't want is it getting more aggressive. So please, if anybody has anything, we're open to suggestions. We aren't sure what to think of it. We already try not to acknowledge or talk about it when we're at the home, but we're wondering what it could be and what we could do to combat it. Ask Reddit. I lived with and took care of my dad when he was terminally ill with esophagus cancer. He fought bravely for four years. We had both been through a traumatic experience of losing my mom, his wife of 30 plus years. It was very suddenly to pancreatic cancer. He didn't know how to live without her and neither did I, but we got through it somehow. So when he said he was going to fight the cancer with chemo, radiation, and then a very extensive surgery, I was so happy, but I know he really wanted to just be reunited with my mom. After four years of fighting it, his journey was coming to an end. He had been on hospice, and his time was running out. I was exhausted with being his main caregiver, and the last weeks of life was just administering meds to him every two hours. So needless to say, I had been very low on sleep. I had such a relationship with my dad that a lot of times I knew what he needed or wanted before he'd even speak a word of it, almost in a telepathic kind of way. I had just administered his meds. I went to lay back down in his bed because he was in a hospital bed now and we were in the same room. He had blackout curtains because he was a night owl his entire life, worked night shift also. So he still slept during the day and never got out of that habit. I must have been asleep for maybe 30 minutes or so, but something woke me up. I didn't open my eyes, I just listened to see if Dad was talking to me. I hoped I could go back to sleep until my alarm just went off to give him his meds. What happened next only lasted seconds, but I can look back at the memory and see it in slow motion. So as I'm listening with my eyes still closed, wondering what awoke me, I get the brightest light shining in my face. It was warm and just blinding, as if the sun was right in front of me. The light dimmed, and I see three orbs. One in front, two in the back, like a triangle, each orb the size of a cantaloupe. Then I hear a voice say, Thank you for taking such wonderful care of your father, but we'll take over from here. The orbs travel down to my feet and over to where my dad was in his bed. They circle his head and then they enter my dad's head. I sat up instantly and looked around the room wondering what the hell just happened. Then the orb said, six days. He had six more days left on earth in his body. I looked around the room to make sure none of the blackout curtains had lifted to explain the light. Checked the home to make sure no family members had stopped by or anybody else shown a flashlight in the room, but everything was how it was supposed to be. I had texted my friend and a few family members about the experience. 
told them that I was either so sleep deprived that I'm having hallucinations or that this really happened. And that in six days, dad'll pass. And that's exactly what happened. Passed away six days after. I don't know why it happened to me, and I don't consider myself religious. I guess I'm spiritual, but part of me thinks that I need to be reminded that we're all souls having a human experience, not the other way around. Because I went into such a dark place after losing my mom to cancer, I honestly can't say where I would be after losing my dad, too. But that experience brought some sort of peace to me. It helped me come to terms with losing both my parents to cancer at a relatively young age. And it reminded my soul that there's more than just this material world. Ask Reddit. There's a whole world out there waiting for us to raise our consciousness. Me and many others have personally been in contact with these beings through telepathy or real contact. There's a federation of planets that won't interfere with our evolution. They've tried to tell our leaders that they can help make peace and love on our planet. But the leaders, of course, don't want this. They want to manipulate and control us. They don't want us to know this. They want our vibration low. They also said many channelers and others who've been in contact that we can ask for help ourselves. Simply project a thought out into the universe giving consent for them to materialize on our planet and help us. They are in the service of love, light, and the intelligent infinity. If approximately one people, or excuse me, one million people ask for this, behind the scenes or in the open, the ones who are deciding that no one can interfere with our evolution will lift the quarantine on our planet, if enough humans ask for it. Sounds crazy if you're new to this, but the information's out there. Through various channelers and other sources. They're highly advanced if we're still babies as a civil excuse me, as a civilization. But that's beginning to shift, and they will wait for us to grow up to realize some things and to orient towards love, peace, and harmony. Unless we ask ourselves for help. It doesn't hurt to send a thought out to the positively oriented civilizations. I recommend Close Encounters of the Fifth Kind. It's free on T-U-B-I TV. Works from the USA with VPN. I also recommend looking into Law of One by Ra. Ask Reddit. I worked for my local news station as a low entry level position, running sound for live shows, operating cameras, master control in between live shows. About two years prior to this, I had a run in with what I've come to know as the Illuminati. Simplest way I can think of describing this thing is that it must be some sort of interdimensional criminal syndicate. Maybe their specialty is civilization seizure and control control is gained once you dominate a percentage of the mass consciousness. Anyway, I encountered the Illuminati when I worked briefly in LA doing film stuff, which was the experience that essentially allowed me to simply walk into news media jobs without having the school credentials. So, things are semi getting back to normal after I was put through some trials and consequences of declining an offer or contract while I was in Hollywood. Ditto. Some pretty dire consequences that I believe I only lived through because I'd earned God's favor somehow and earned some divine protection. Don't ask me how I earned that protection, but the only thing I can think of is that I was essentially the purest soul among those people I worked with. And the people I previously worked with must have been deep into some pretty dark stuff. I already had a rough idea from the conversations and the locker room talk that they had together. But I was always an outsider. I must not have broken any big laws or committed much sin, but at the time I had no earthly idea what sin even was. But somehow God had intervened and delivered me from Los Angeles. Three years later, estimated, haven't sat down to really iron out my timeline, 
I'm one year into my job at a news station, which was essentially, well, I guess a dead end. At least morally for me, because the longer I was there, the less and less I found purpose. I didn't believe in anything I was doing, and this only became more apparent when I started learning more about the values and morals of everyone I worked with. I feel ya. Meaning, everybody I worked with was more or less dead, spiritually. There were perhaps one or two people that I felt had a strong sense of soul, but otherwise, they were all dead. This began to have quite the effect on me, and somehow I became dead again and have forgotten everything that God had done for me. What I was delivered from in Los Angeles. I ended up reaching out to a former friend who was still closely associated with the undesirables I'd worked with in L.A., unaware at the time that they, well, they sort of had this hold over him, and knowing that they very well could have attempted to corrupt me again through my friend. I took a road trip to see this old friend, and we went to a concert together. He gave me some drugs to enjoy the concert with, made weird comments about his drug source being the FBI, saying things like, what do you mean to tell me you don't have an FBI guy? Lame jokes, most likely. But that evening at the concert was just bizarre. In the heightened state, I sensed I was being monitored. Most notably, there was one very odd fellow sitting right next to my friend and me. They seemed to have quite the interest in us. The guy was completely alone and didn't even seem to be interested in the music whatsoever but his attention seemed to be fixed on my friend and I. My friend sensed my suspicions, although I never spoke them out loud. Then things just began to get very strange, and I felt as though I was under some sort of psychic attack. This is probably the hardest part to explain, but bizarre things just seemed to start happening from that point forward. I began to sense a number of people in the audience that just didn't belong. Loners spread out among the stadium with no real purpose in enjoying music, but were clearly up to something else. I theorize I was given some sort of experimental drug and was observed along with who knows how many others that night into our reaction to various stimuli responses. A study of sorts with implications and whose ends I wish not to know, although I'm pretty sure we all know. Fast forward about a month after this. I think I experienced some sort of flashback or suffered a delayed response to the chemical agent I was given. Set off with some sort of external trigger. Out of nowhere, one night when I was out of work, some dude on the sidewalk approached saying something about my shirt. Can't recall exactly what he said, but it was something really lame like, Hey, that's MK Ultra, isn't it? Whatever, dude. Never saw him again, but... Weird events and people started approaching me on a scale that I've never much experienced in 20 years alive before that. In one week, I would have people coming up to me starting weird conversations when I would go years without anybody so much as looking in my direction. I suppose I was the recipient of something I've come to learn as gang stalking, or the targeted individual program. People would be following me everywhere to remote places I would often go beforehand for the very purpose of getting away from people. This all started to accelerate until something happened one day when I realized how pointless my current path is. Any path, really, but especially the one I was currently on. The news was one big elaborate joke. Nobody was who they pretended to be and they certainly didn't believe anything they were trying to get others to believe. My news anchors would put on sad faces and talk about horrific events or even the plain ordinary ones. And when their microphone shut off, they would mock the people they pretended to care about. Nobody said anything, nobody cared. It was all one big ritual until everybody was laughing at the same jokes. Jokes about people and very visible suffering or discomfort. I had had enough of sickness. Decided I had to be somewhere very urgently. Another thing that's impossible to describe, but I was on my way home when I saw a sweet homeless lady on a corner who I'd met a few weeks prior. I bought her and her boyfriend some lunch and briefly heard her story, and I, well, I knew when I saw her I was meant to give her something. She smiled at me on the corner and I just emptied my pockets, gave her my phone and wallet and told her, 
gotta keep this for me. I'm not allowed to use these right now. She asked me if everything was okay, but I knew I was about to face some trials. Her eyes looked saddened, but at the same time as though they knew what I was about to do. God had summoned me, and I dare not miss the call. What I just started to describe in the last paragraph happened in the middle of summer. Record-breaking heat, so they say. I had just the clothes on my back when I started walking to the desert and received some visions of utter destruction. I took off my shirt, and I can't recall if I had my shoes on or not, but I was pleading to God or just to let me suffer and not subject anybody else to what was to come. I left my shirt under the shade of the only tree nearby and just started walking. It didn't take long, but I began to feel as though I was about to pass out, and I did. I woke up with my face in the sand. My mouth was dry to the point I never wished to experience again. I was defeated, and I thought I was being prepared to die. About a mile ahead of me was a native man wearing black plastic trash bags as a shirt, who I kept trying to catch up with, but kept slipping farther and farther away. I think he was... Maybe a sort of spirit guide or something, because if he hadn't have caught my attention, I wouldn't have discovered what, well, what might have brought me some valuable time. I eventually turned around and found a storm pipe, rested and it found shade. I have no idea how long I was in direct sunlight after I'd passed out, but it must have been a while. I started to have difficulty breathing. My mouth was completely dry, and each minute I felt the coarse dryness start to extend down my throat. I knew I needed water, and I was about a quarter mile from the highway gas station, so I started walking. The last twenty feet or so were the most difficult. There was one shaded tree surrounded by a patch of grass that must have been for travelers and truckers. I knew this gas station as I had passed by it all the time on an old commute to work, but I don't know how I made it. The closer I got, the more weak I became, and my feet were on fire, and my mouth and lips were beginning to seal themselves shut literally felt my lips peel and tear, and when I attempted to open my mouth, I was just whatever I was about. Well, it just felt like the air was only let in, only accelerating this dryness and choking my throat. Somebody was waiting for me at the tree, with a single gallon of water, and it was ice cold. He asked me some questions, and I felt as though he was telepathically extracting information from me. He wanted me to answer some questions first before he would give me water, and then he said I could have it. I think he was trying to extract some sort of blueprint or design that I had just seen before this all started. Maybe even a day or two before it. But the last thing I remember about this man was that he called me by my last name. Told me I should go back to that tree to get my shirt. Pretty sure it was verbatim. If I were you, mister, I would go find that shirt. I was convinced at the time that the only way that person could have known I would have could make it to that tree as if they would teleport or time travel. It must have had some sort of implant or tracking device on me as well. Ask Reddit. So this will get buried, but whatever. I found it. So when I was in fourth grade, I would often stay at my friend Greg's house. His family was cool and didn't mind me hanging out all the time, and Greg always mentioned that his house was haunted, like footsteps in the hallway, shadowy figures, etc. But I never took him seriously. Shut up, Greg, you're not scaring me. One night, we decided to sneak out and wrap toilet paper on our friend's house down the street. We thought we were badasses. We waited till about 3 a.m., stole a roll of TP from the bathroom, and silently left out the front door. We were gone for maybe 15 minutes. But we were worn out. So we went to the TV room and took our spots. He was on the pull-out couch, and I was on the floor. I was a weird kid. I preferred it. After watching TV for a bit, we decided to pass out. As soon as we turned off the TV light... The light in his kitchen became very bright and loud, almost as if it was going to explode. Then footsteps ran from the kitchen to where we were, and I promise I'm not making this up. The couch cushion next to me depressed as if someone was sitting on it. I whispered to Greg, what was that? It 
promptly told me to shut up just as the entire sequence repeated itself. Bright light, footsteps, couch. I threw the covers over my head and somehow went to sleep. The next morning I woke underneath the covers to the sound of Greg getting in trouble. His mom noticed that the last roll of teepee was gone. Rookie mistake on our part. Ask Reddit. My whole family is convinced that our cottage is haunted. About three years ago, my uncle's wife and her friends were up there on their own. Three or four of them. They were sitting out on the deck right by the back door at about 1 a.m. shooting the shit. One of them says that they can see something on the rocks by the lake. So they all turned. They all saw the same thing. It looked like a little boy climbing around on the rocks, playing and suddenly vanishing. Well, a couple of days after that, they're all talking to my grandma and grandpa about all this, the owners of the cottage. My grandma brought up that she had a very scary paranormal experience in one of the rooms. She was sleeping and was woken up by something pressing down on her chest really hard. She saw a little boy sitting on her chest and she tried to yell for help, but she couldn't. So she just closed her eyes and prayed for it to go away. When she woke up, she thought she had just had the worst nightmare of her life until she saw that she had two bruises on her chest right where the pressure was. She didn't bring this up until a couple of years ago. She didn't want to scare anyone from coming up. She did some investigating on her own and found out that the people who owned the cottage before us had a son who drowned in the lake. Ask Reddit. I lived in a pretty spooky New York City apartment for three years. The place was on 29th and 3rd, on the first floor in the back of the very old building. All of the windows looked out into a narrow brick alleyway, so naturally the place was very dark all the time. When my roommate and I first moved in, we smelled something awful coming from the apartment next door. It was akin to rotting garbage and cooked cabbage. I figured perhaps it was actually just garbage because we all get lazy from time to time and don't want to put pants on to take out the trash. After a few weeks, though, I told the super about it, who knocked on the guy's room to no avail. A few days later, I came from class and there was a cleaning crew clearing out the place. Pretty sure what I was smelling all the time was dead guy funk. And that's when weird things began to happen. My roommate Audrey swore she heard something moving around in the closet on more than one occasion. New York City apartments are notoriously small, and this place was no exception. The closets in that place were tiny, scarcely large enough for a person to stand in wedged into the corner of the room like an architectural afterthought. I chalked it up to mice or something. Those little fuckers have been eating my mac and cheese for months until she said she actually saw movement in there. Like a shadow, something dark. Nothing else happened for a while until one night when Audrey was home alone talking, excuse me, taking her makeup off. It was always a long nightly ritual for her. She was standing in the front mirror when something walked straight past the open door. There was a wall right next to the bathroom. There's no logical place somebody could have disappeared to. Oftentimes, I would stay up late painting in my room because I would always kind of save my assignments for the last minute. Perhaps it was sleep deprivation or delirium, but I swear I'd seen a figure standing in my doorway in the early morning hours. As soon as I'd turned my head, my heart's racing. I'd seen nothing, but here's the worst part. It was just a few months until we were about to move out. I was in my room working a good 20 feet across from the bathroom with my door opened. That was while Audrey was doing her makeup thing. All of a sudden, she yells at me, telling me to get off. I lean back in my chair to look at her across the living room, and she realizes I'm way too far away to have touched her. Something had grabbed her shoulder from behind and pulled her around. Something she didn't see in the mirror. She was shoved quickly, but not necessarily violently, by a hand that wasn't there. That place still gives me the creeps. See ya.